Emmanuel, God with us. That's the name for the child. This is God come down. This is God become flesh. This is God with us. And as we shall see, God for us. Welcome to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. I'm Steve Hiller, and let me be the first to wish you a very Merry Christmas. And Jonathan, what a fitting title for today's message, Emmanuel, God with us, what we celebrate on this Christmas day. Well, that is the heart of our celebration, and that is the heart of the good news. It is the heart of the message of Christmas, that God has come to us in the person of his son, come to us as a baby, that he might live among us. And the significance of that is so massively profound, we can hardly get our heads around it. The Bible tells us that because of our rebellion against God, because of our sin, we've been separated from the God who made us. And that happened right back at the beginning in the Garden of Eden. But now God has come to us in the person of his Son, that he might have relationship with us, that he might live among us, and that ultimately, as we trust in his Son, we might live with him for eternity. You know, what a great truth that is for us to reflect on and to look at in a deeper manner today of all days. So grab a Bible, join us in the book of Matthew. We're in chapter one as we begin our message called Emmanuel. Here is Jonathan. Emmanuel, God with us. That's the name for the child. Promised from of old, given from above. It's a lovely name. It rolls off the tongue, but pause with me for a moment, if you would, just to give thought to that idea, to the truth that this name proclaims. In this child of Christmas, the baby of the manger, the infant in the arms of Mary, in him we are beholding and experiencing the presence of the God of heaven here on earth with us. This is God come down. This is God become flesh. This is God with us. And as we shall see, God for us. I want to take the time that we have available together today simply to reflect on this remarkable word, on this beautiful name. I want to consider together the very wonderful lessons about God and his salvation Christmas plan that we learn in this simple name, Emmanuel. The name contains for us profound truths about God, the God who came to be with us in Christ. And here is the first one. Emmanuel tells us that God is committed to reconciliation. That's the first lesson of the name. God is profoundly committed to reconciliation. The God of heaven, the God of the Bible, the God of Christmas, he is a reconciling God. I don't know if you've taken any time to watch the Harry and Meghan Netflix series that speaks about their experience of royal life and the relational challenges that have developed within that family. I have to say, I haven't taken the time to watch that myself. I don't have any particular desire to do so, but it seems that much of the world has. And so we are all very acutely aware, perhaps more aware than we would like to be, of this relational rift within this prominent family. And the world, I think, is sort of collectively wishing that things could be made right, that reconciliation, that healing could happen. Theirs is a very public story played out in the media and in the press, rather unfortunately, but we all feel, don't we, something of the pain of that, because to some extent, we all know what it is to experience the heartache of damaged relationships, of discord, of strain. Some will know the acute pain of alienation, the experience of a a fight, a disagreement, a relational breakdown with the loved ones. It, 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 it's an excruciating thing, of course. The, uh, the silence, the distance, the, the not seeing them, and perhaps it lasts for a long time. But it's such a wonderful thing as well, isn't it? When someone takes the initiative to break on through, to uh, show up, to try and make things right. 
I don't know your story, of course, and the details of it, but if you're someone with a broken relationship within your life, an estranged child or sibling, a long-lost friend, if you have that in your life, I guess there is a part of you that might just be overjoyed beyond measure if that person appeared on your doorstep this Christmas season. Maybe you have no idea where that person lives now. The, the relational breakdown was so bad, they walked out the door and they've never come back. For things to move forward, for things to be made right, one party needs to show up. One party needs to cross the divide, needs to take the initiative, needs to pursue reconciliation. The whole story of the Bible centers on a relational breakdown. In fact, according to the Bible, the whole story of the world hinges upon a relational breakdown that happened long ago at the beginning of history, and it's a breakdown that impacts and affects all of us here in a very profound way. The Bible teaches us so clearly that God made us. He made you and he made me for relationship with him. He created us to know him, to be known by him. He allowed our human parents to live in a place where his presence was available to them. He set Adam and Eve in a beautiful garden, a garden that he would visit regularly. Genesis tells us of how God would come down and walk with Adam in the garden in the cool of the afternoon. There was access, there was fellowship, there was even, we might say, friendship there, but then things went sour. And they went sour so quickly. The Creator, He gave plenty of freedom to Adam and Eve, and actually only one prohibition. They could eat from any tree in the garden, save one, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It sounds simple enough, but the prohibition, the forbidden fruit, as it were, it was, it was too enticing in the end. What is God keeping from us? They wondered. What, why shouldn't we eat, they asked. What is he holding back from us that we might enjoy and we might benefit from? And so Adam and Eve distrusted God and disobeyed his word and they ate. And in that simple but oh so significant action, the, the relationship was broken, the fellowship was destroyed, and Adam and Eve that day, they came under the judgment of God. They were thrown out of the garden thrown out of his presence, and the ramifications of those events on that day were utterly profound. God is the source and the giver of life, and to be barred from his presence, it simply means death. It means the loss of the blessing of his presence. It means a hopeless future. Now, throughout the Old Testament story, and it's a long story, God indicated, he made it clear that he intended to address this crisis, that he wanted to make a way for reconciliation, a way for his people to come home to him, to come back to the garden as it were. He called Abraham. He established the nation of Israel. He invited the people to worship him at the temple in Jerusalem. These were all very, very hopeful indications. They were powerful declarations of intent, but they weren't the full solution. And through all these rolling years of Israel's history, through the centuries and indeed through the millennia, Israel had her ups and her downs, her days of glory, her days of discouragement. But the promise and the hope, it only became more concrete and more certain, and it centered more and more clearly on the coming of a very special person, of a baby of God himself. This becomes especially clear in the prophecy of Isaiah, actually in days that are very, very threatening for the nation, at a time when Israel was under increasing pressure, huge pressure from foreign powers, the Lord sharpens at that stage the promise of hope. And he speaks in concrete terms of his plan. And this is the prophecy that Matthew quotes. This is Isaiah 7 and verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. In days of distress, 
When foreign powers are threatening the people of God, the Lord promises a sign for the people, a powerful sign of his commitment to them, a sign of hope. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, centuries before Bethlehem, and the star, and the stable. This is the promise of God. The promise actually takes further shape as the prophecy continues. The future hope for this child becomes more and more concrete in very famous words from the prophet Isaiah 9 and verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and of peace, there shall be no end. In this fallen world, in this world under judgment, in, in this world where things have broken down so badly because access to God has been disrupted by the fall, in all this, God has not given up on humanity he has not given up on his people. A baby is going to be born in miraculous circumstances, born of a virgin. His name shall be called, well, many things actually, but among them, Emmanuel, God with us. And then on that momentous night, centuries after the Lord spoke this promise, millennia, after the tragic events of the garden, God came. He came in the person of his son. He came in human flesh. He came as a baby born to a virgin, born in a stable, born that first Christmas. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths and a message called Emmanuel. It is part of our series, Name Above All Names. And what a great thing to look at today. The fact that God has come to earth and has chosen to live amongst us some 2,000 years ago. Certainly what we celebrate this Christmas season. Well, we're glad that you're listening today. But I know that from time to time, you may not be able to listen to Jonathan's teaching on the radio. Or maybe you've just stumbled across us today because your schedule is a little bit different than what it normally would be. I want to let you know you can always connect with this ministry and Jonathan's teaching online. You can come and listen at our website, EncounterTheTruth.org. That's EncounterTheTruth.org. You can also listen if you have the Encounter the Truth app. That's free, and you're going to find that at your app store. Well, Jonathan, I know that you are passionate about Encounter the Truth's daily broadcast. Well, I certainly am, Steve. And if I could take a moment to speak directly to our listeners today, please let me say that my heartbeat for you is to know God more deeply, to encounter Him in a fresh, new way through His Word. And that's why we take the time to study the Bible together, because knowing God more deeply and personally encountering Him happens as we engage with His Word, the Bible. So if I might just ask you, if you have encountered the Lord through these broadcasts, would you please take a moment and just let us know? You can't imagine what an encouragement it is to our team when we hear of lives touched by what we hope is the daily, clear, life-changing teaching of the Word of God. Well, that is what it's all about, right? Grasping the gospel, understanding God's Word, and if you have been touched by this program, I want to ask you to consider not only that word of encouragement, but also a gift as well, because we do depend on your financial generosity to keep Jonathan's teaching on this station. You can support the ministry when you call us at 1-833-998-7884. That's 833-99-TRUTH. Or through our website, EncounterTheTruth.org. Well, if you did join us a little bit late, I want to let you know we're in the book of Matthew. We're at chapter 1, looking at verse 23 today. So let's get back to our message entitled Emmanuel. Here's Jonathan. Pursuing reconciliation, it often involves making a journey, a journey of some kind, going to the other person where they are, crossing some physical distance. It may be just a matter of going down a hallway and knocking on a sibling's bedroom door in your house. That may be what it takes. It may mean driving across town. It may mean getting on a plane, taking a trip, a, a, a flight. Here in the national capital region, we have the privilege of welcoming many diplomats from other countries and getting to know families who are posted here for a time. I was speaking on one occasion with a diplomat from a foreign land. We were just chatting away 
about this and that, but this ambassador shared with me how, how their delegation, their staff here, here at the embassy in Ottawa was pretty small just at the present time, smaller than it used to be. And, and I was curious about that. I, I, I asked a, a little more, why was that so? He wanted to be very careful to be uh, polite, and he was very, very polite. But he said, you know, one basic issue is that it's just so cold here. <laughs> uh, he said that the younger diplomatic staff these days, they're just not so keen to come. In the earlier days, an older generation of uh, diplomats would have welcomed the, the appointment as, as prestigious, a major country, G7 capital. But uh, the younger generation, he said, you know, the uh, Instagram uh, generation, they might prefer somewhere in the sun <laughs> and near a beach. Well, fair enough, I thought. Who can blame them? I get it. God's great plan. It involved him crossing a great divide. It involved him making a journey to us. It involved him coming to a place that was actually not all that attractive, not all that inviting. In the person of his son, he came into this world of sin and suffering. And coming among us, he, he, you know, he didn't land at a luxurious beach resort. He didn't even choose the palace. He didn't select the governor's mansion. He didn't book a suite of rooms at the Jerusalem Ritz-Carlton. No, he, he came to a place of little account, to a family of little account, to a maiden who, who didn't have so much as a comfortable room and a warm place to give birth. It was a stable. It was an animal shelter. It, it was a manger for the baby. In pursuing reconciliation, God made the journey to us. God showed up. He came. Emmanuel, God with us, the arrival of this baby teaches us in a profound way that God is a reconciling God. God is a God of grace. We were cast out of that garden because of sin, banned from God's presence, unable to enjoy what Adam enjoyed, walking with God in the cool of the afternoon, but now God has come among us. Emmanuel has come to us, and he would live among his earthly family. He would walk among his disciples. He would offer friendship and companionship to them. You see, that which is lost in Eden is regained in some profound way in that stable. Somehow, by the miracle of the incarnation, the miracle of the virgin birth, God made it possible to come among a sinful people like us, to enter a fallen world as a human being. We can't pretend to plumb the depths of this miracle, of this mystery, but in the details of this simple and this beautiful story, we are being told that God has achieved that which seemed unachievable. How could a holy God, separated from sinners, undefiled in his purity and perfection, how could he come among us and in the person of his son be Emmanuel? Well, in the wisdom and the power of God, it happened in the most remarkable and the most wonderful way, the way actually promised eight centuries before in the prophecy of Isaiah, a virgin would bear a son, a son named Emmanuel, God with us. And so we enter the story in Matthew, and he tells us, verse 18, that the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. And what a way that was. What a story it is. A young woman of good character, betrothed to a decent man. But before the wedding, she's found to be with child. And Matthew puts it so simply, verse 18, but what wonder is contained in these words, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. This is how the God of heaven would make the great journey and cross the divide. The Holy Spirit would enable this young woman by miracle to conceive the very Son of God. Now, Joseph is perplexed. There must have been some impropriety here. Something untoward has taken place. He'll need to find a gracious way out, he thinks, but there's a dream, an angel, a message from heaven. Verse 20, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. 
This is God at work. This is God coming among us. This is God fulfilling his plan and his promise of old, verse 22. All this, all these wonderful things took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet all those centuries ago in Isaiah. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. How would God cross this great relational divide, the divide between his holiness and a sinful humanity, the, the divide between heaven and earth, the divide marked by a chasm of judgment. He would come among us in the person of his son as a human baby, as a child, Emmanuel. He came among us as Emmanuel to bridge the gap, to pursue reconciliation, but achieving reconciliation in the end was going to take more than simply arriving. It was going to take more than simply showing up. There was going to be a cost. In most human stories of relational breakdown and reconciliation, there has been some kind of wrong on both sides, much of the time, not always. And making things right involves action from both parties. But here the dynamic is so very, very unusual, so very, very surprising. You see, the wrong was all ours. The sin, that was all us. God was the innocent party. He was the entirely righteous one within this. But Emmanuel took the initiative and came. And the story of the baby in the manger, this story is going to lead unstoppably to the cross of Calvary. The God who came among us, Emmanuel, he came very specifically that he might ultimately die in our place. At the cross of Calvary, we learn that God came here among us to be the one to pay the price of our wrongdoing, to bear our judgment, to do all that was necessary to remove the barrier of sin and judgment that stood between us and him. And so in Emmanuel, God has shown himself to be the supreme reconciler. He not only took the initiative to cross the divide, to come among us to make things right, but though he was the innocent party in this relational breakdown, he came to pay the full cost himself to make things right. Emmanuel, it means to us that God is committed to reconciliation. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths, and we're going to pause the teaching right here, but we'll continue looking at the name Emmanuel on our next broadcast. I hope you make it a point to be listening, but if you're ever away from the radio and you miss Jonathan's teaching, you can always listen online. Come to our website. It's EncounterTheTruth.org. There you can stream the program or download an MP3 for free. Again, that's at EncounterTheTruth.org. You can also listen if you have the Encounter the Truth app. That's free, and you're going to find that at your app store. Simply look for Encounter the Truth. You know, this radio program is not only on this station, but we also make it available online and through the Encounter the Truth app. But all we do is made possible through your generosity. So thank you for giving to and supporting this ministry. And as you give a gift of any amount this month, we want to send you a couple of copies of Jonathan's book. It's called Light of the World. And Jonathan, that's kind of an intriguing title. What do you mean by this? Well, Jesus speaks of himself as being the light of the world. And it's such an intriguing idea that the Lord Jesus Christ himself brings light into a place of darkness. But, you know, when we consider it, I think we understand exactly what he means. This this world can be a very, very dark place. There's a lot of evil. There's a lot of suffering. There's a lot of sadness in this world. But the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world to bring hope and to bring truth and to give us the opportunity to know the God who made us and to open the way to us to life eternal. He is the light that came down into the darkness. And in this brief book, I simply want to explain what it means for the Lord Jesus to be light. I hope that'll be an encouragement to those who already know him and are rejoicing in his coming this Christmas. But I also really hope, and I do pray, that there will be those who read this book who don't yet know the Lord Jesus and haven't, as it were, received the light of his coming in their own life. And I'd love for you to read this book if that's your situation, if that's who you are, and discover what it means for the Lord Jesus to be the light of the world. Well, we want to send you not one, but two copies of Jonathan's book, Light of the World, as our way of saying thank you for your financial support. One for you, one for you to give away. 
You can give online at EncounterTheTruth.org or call us at 833-99-TRUTH. Again, our website is EncounterTheTruth.org and our phone number is 833-998-7884. For producer Mark Bretta and our Bible teacher Jonathan Griffiths, I'm Steve Hiller. Thanks for listening and I hope you'll join us next time.